So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz and, and welcome to this um, uh, Courage to Be lecture series for the Courage to Be seminars at Bard. Uh, I think this is the second talk of the semester. Um, the third is going to um, uh, feature uh, Irshad Manji, who's written a book called Don't Label Me. And uh, um, uh, there's going to be a tutorial that reads that book along with uh, Robin D'Angelo's book, um, White Fragility. And uh, you'll be getting emails about that, about signing up for it. It's an online tutorial um, that a couple of the professors from Courage to Be, along with myself, will help lead. And if people want to join that, um, please do uh, respond to the email and, and, and join in. And those who um, uh, do join it, uh, we'll then get to interview uh, Irshad Manji uh, when she comes to talk uh, later in the semester, I think in April. So I just wanted to to make that announcement. Um, so tonight uh, we're going. To, I'm going to uh, introduce one of the Courage to Be fellows. Just um, uh, a reminder. I think after the talk, we're going to have a short breakout session where you guys can talk about your uh, ideas and then come back and um, ask questions of our speaker. Once again, these are the speakers are chosen by students, the students courage to be fellows, and they, um, they do all the work and prepare the introductions. And uh, it's, it's really a, a wonderful system. So I wanna thank all the courage to be fellows. Tonight, I, I'd like to introduce Valentina Flores, who's a junior at Bard College, majoring in political science and human rights uh, she has aspirations of attending law school after undergrad. I think after she took a course um, with today's speaker uh, or co-took a course with today's speaker. Uh, she's formerly the co-leader of the Bard Immigration Coalition. And um, she's active in a number of Bard clubs, including the Bard New Orleans Initiative, focused on criminal justice work and a courage to be fellow. So I'm gonna introduce Valentina Flores and she'll introduce tonight's speaker. Welcome, Valentina. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us at our second Courage to Be Lecture of the Year. I'm excited to introduce to you all Steven Zyman. Steven Zyman is a professor at CUNY School of Law and director of the Criminal Defense Clinic. Prior to working at CUNY, he was the executive director of the Fund for Modern Courts, a court reform organization that advocates for the improvement of the New York State court system. Professor Simon began his legal career at the Legal Aid Society's Criminal Defense Division, first as a member of staff and then as a supervising attorney. He has been involved in many advisory and oversight committees, including the Sentencing Reform Commission and the Jury Trial Project, among others. He has lectured widely and written several articles about criminal justice and judicial selection, and has spent the last 25 years working in the area of criminal defense. Professor Zyman is a devoid of practitioner of courage given his work to confront and rectify the crisis of mass incarceration, as he believes it is necessary to decarcerate the nation's prisons. Without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Steven Zyman. Thank you, Valentina, um, for that in introduction and for inviting me to, um, to be here tonight. It is, um, it's a pleasure, it really is. It's, it's a privilege. I was saying before, I only wish we were all in person, but um, here we are. Thank you all for coming on a beautiful Wednesday night, which I hope this weather portends better days ahead. Uh, I have to start by expressing my affinity for and connection to Bard, uh, as I think has come up and Valentina sort of mentioned or alluded to before, I think before most of you joined, but my law students work in collaboration with Bard students in Tom Keenan and Brett Green's uh, advocacy video class, part of the human rights program. And it has been a wonderful partnership. I think Tom would agree it's been challenging at times, but I think that's partly what makes it wonderful. Uh, I'm, of course, very familiar with the Bard Prison Initiative. Many of the people we work with have benefited greatly from that program. And one of my closest friends and former students, a woman named Cynthia Conti Cook, is a Bard alum from 2003 and is one of the rising stars in the civil rights lawyer world. So Bard holds a special place in, uh, in my heart. 
So the title of my presentation, uh, Punishment, Redemption, and Mercy. And it, it comes out of an op-ed that I wrote several years ago when I began working with a woman named Judy Clark, who was serving a sentence of 75 years to life and was seeking clemency, a sentence commutation, so she wouldn't die in prison. And I should pause here for a moment. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with sentencing, but New York State is what is euphemistically called the truth in sentencing state. So what that means is, for example, if someone is sentenced to 25 to life, a lot of people will believe, and in some states it's actually true, you might get out after 10, 11, 12 years, uh, not in New York State. A lot of this has to do with federal funding, but the long and short of it is in New York, you have to do that bottom number, the minimum, you have to do 25 years before you even become eligible for parole. So in Judy's case, she had to serve 75 years before having a shot at freedom. And in other words, she was sentenced to, to die in prison. And in the course of my, my work with Judy, as I began to dive a little deeper, not only into her situation, but into the circumstances that led to someone being sentenced to 75 to life, I learned that there are about 9,000 people in Blue State, New York, serving life sentences. And I went out to meet a lot of those folks. I went to many of New York's 50 state prisons and met with the lifers and long-termers organizations at several of the maximum security prisons. And I learned that so many of the men and women that I met who were serving these life and long-term sentences were presently thoughtful, compassionate, decent, transformed, redeemed people who all shared one characteristic, they were destined to languish in prison and die there. So back to the title of my work, Punishment, Redemption, and Mercy, um, it hasn't aged particularly well, that, that title. Um, might have been a little wildly optimistic because over the next several years, I certainly learned that New York has an awful lot of punishment and there's an awful lot of redemption, but there is precious little by way of mercy. And that's really what got me started in the clemency work. So ever since I met Judy uh, and spent these several years working uh, with her, trying to extricate her from a death sentence, I devoted my teaching and my career to, to clemency work, both at the state and federal level. I just wanna stop here for a moment just to be clear about terms. Clemency is generally, it, it's, two, it's an umbrella term for two different things. So on the one hand, there's a pardon. And by a pardon, that expunges or erases somebody's conviction. And pardons come into play for people who are usually out of prison and someone says they, they request a pardon from a governor or from the president because their conviction prevents them from getting a license, prevents them from getting certain employment. Um, they face deportation because of a conviction. So they're basically begging for someone to vacate the conviction. That's one type of clemency. The other far more controversial part of clemency is a sentence commutation. It doesn't erase the conviction, but it reduces the time you must serve. And the reason it's that much more controversial is because when a governor or a president grants somebody a sentence commutation, many, many times that person is set free. And as I'll talk about, uh, more often than not, in, certainly in New York, we're talking about people who are convicted of very, very serious crimes. So the clemency power is it's unique. And I, I say that, I, I don't think there's anything like it in law. And as a practicing attorney for a number of years and having taught law in several law schools, I don't think that's hyperbole. It is, there, there's no, I can't even, I have tried for the longest time to figure out what might be comparable and there's nothing like it. It is in the explicit text of the federal constitution it's in the explicit text of most state constitutions, and it is a vast and unfettered power given to the executive 
to set somebody free. No mandated process. There's no appeal. As the saying goes, with the stroke of a pen, using our governor as an example, if he wanted to today, he could take any of the thousands of applications on his desk with no inquiry whatsoever and just sign these applications and send home thousands of people. Originally, clemency was viewed as appropriate for people who suddenly had claims of innocence. And I think we can all agree that makes a lot of sense. Somebody who's been incarcerated for decades, they, there's a hidden piece of evidence that is revealed and the appellate process, the legal process is done. They have no recourse. So clemency was, is, this, is seen as this incredible safety valve to right a wrong. And it also was used traditionally, and I'm talking going back a few hundred years, when there was just something untoward about someone's conviction. Maybe they weren't innocent, but maybe they didn't have the most adequate defense. Or maybe we've learned something about one of the witnesses against them that casts some doubt on the validity of their conviction. But these days, there's really one word that captures clemency, and it's mercy. It's supposed to be seen as an act of mercy. And for that very reason, most governors grant clemency, even though they receive applications all throughout the year, they grant it at the end of the year, usually right around Christmas or New Year's. The theory being it's this benevolent act of mercy consistent with the spirit of the holidays consistent with a new year, if you will. Now, having said that, it's this vast and unfettered and truly awesome power. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's virtually never used. And that's really what has been motivating me to become involved in it. So using Andrew Cuomo as an example, he's gotten over 6,000 requests for clemency in his 11 plus years in office I don't know if anybody wants to hazard a guess how many sentence commutations he's granted out of that. If we were in person, I'd call on somebody, but I won't do that. But it's, it's 31. And of those 31, only 15 are legitimate. And by that, I mean the other 16 were people who were going home in a matter of months anyway. They were drug offenses. They were, there was nothing controversial. Only really 15 people. So I guess and this is many ways the, the subject of what I wanna to talk to you about is if we have this power in the constitution that we think is so critical, whether it's about innocence or mercy, why is it so rarely used? And maybe for me, and I hope I'm not trying to shoehorn something in, but maybe that's where courage comes in. Where is the courage to be in clemency? Where, and ultimately it's why is it so lacking? So by now, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the phrase mass incarceration. It's nationally known, it's nationally agreed upon, in particular the devastation of black and brown families and communities. It's readily accepted, which was no small feat. But the question that has yet to be addressed is what to do about it. So there have been articles, law review articles, scholarly articles, books, mass incarceration, and from my perspective, and I hope this doesn't sound too cynical, it's mostly about hand-wringing. Like, isn't it terrible? How did we get to this place? And did it start in the 1970s in the war on drugs? And it is about capitalism and it is about racism and all of that is true, but no one's doing anything about it. Clemency is the most readily available means to redress, to rectify mass incarceration. We don't need a new law. We don't need a new task force. We don't need a new book or an article. We just need the political will, maybe the political courage. So to the extent there are reforms that people are putting out there regarding the criminal legal system and mass incarceration, they suffer from two problems. One is they are all prospective, meaning Let's get rid of mandatory minimum sentences. Let's get rid of or reduce drug sentences. Let's get rid of sentencing enhancements. Like I'm sure many of you are familiar with three strikes and you're out, those sorts of bills that put somebody away for life for their third felony conviction. But those are all prospective. 
They don't help the people who are currently incarcerated. The other problem with the reforms, and this is really at the heart of my work, is that even those that reach back to the people who are the living embodiments of mass incarceration, even those reforms by and large only affect low hanging fruit, right? the so-called low level nonviolent drug offender. Perhaps the best example, President Obama unveiled a remarkable clemency initiative, the first of its kind. No president had done anything like it. And obviously it only affected the federal prison population, which is a small fraction of all those incarcerated. The problem was the president limited it to people who were convicted of drug crimes. And why is that a problem? It's because to really rectify, to redress mass incarceration, or as my colleagues have called it, American genocide, it is necessary to meaningfully decarcerate. And we could release everybody who is incarcerated on a drug possession or drug sale case, and we would still have a problem with mass incarceration. Why? Because here's a fact. The majority of the two plus million people in jails and prisons in this country, the majority are there for serious violent crime. And that in turn forces us to confront a very serious and hard question. How much time must someone do for a serious violent crime? For a murder. If you've killed someone, did you just forfeit the, the right to ever walk free again because you took a life? Why should you have the opportunity to live, to have a family, to enjoy walking out on a beautiful evening like this? And so for me, confronting those particular questions, it does take a form of courage. And I, as I think about the problem with mass incarceration, and courage, I guess I, I view it through several different lenses. So on the one hand, there's political courage or the lack thereof. So we know, as I said before, that governors have the power to do this. And you can search high and low to see how many governors have used this power that they have to reunite families, to rebuild families, to rebuild communities tell you one other interesting footnote, which I think will come as no surprise, but having done this work for a number of years now and looking at the people who are serving these life sentences, you can draw a straight line through the life sentences and the decimation of families and communities to gentrification in so many of New York City's neighborhoods. I said, this was about four years ago. I said to a bunch of my students, if I get one more letter from somebody who says they were from Bedford Stuyvesant and is now doing 50 to life from something that happened in the 1980s, I long ago lost track. There, and I don't know how familiar folks are with the neighborhoods of New York City, but you can just, you can point each one that have been most recently gentrified and see the impact of what we have done to mostly young, 18 to 22 year old black and Latino men. So then, why won't governors do this? I think a lot of it is obvious. Some of you are familiar with what people refer to over and over ad nauseum, the Willie Horton fear, Willie Horton, and other, without going into the details. If you're the elected governor, if you're Andrew Cuomo and you have political aspirations, you worry about releasing someone who's convicted of a very serious crime why you're worried they might get out and do something horrific and sink your career. And that's, that's part of it. Ultimately for me, I don't think that's why governors are so reluctant. I think it's much broader than that. I think the lack of courage has to do with just base political ambition and a question that has been put to me by several people with the power to grant clemency. One governor actually said to me, how does this boost my popularity? Where's the constituency clamoring for clemency? So it's one thing to say it might not hurt you politically. Elected officials wanna know that somehow they're going to get a boost. 
there's the related question of courage. There's le legislative courage that is sorely lacking. And by that, I mean the courage to rethink and recalibrate sentencing, to reimagine, redefine what we think is necessary punishment. I would love to have the opportunity to spend hours with you and give you some, they're not hypotheticals, they're real facts of the people I work with. Put you each in a room and say, okay, put down on a piece of paper what you think is the appropriate punishment and figure out where do we come out? Especially those of you who are familiar with the phrase mass incarceration, or maybe some of you in your families, maybe there's direct experience with impacted individuals, families, communities, and see if we are so at odds about what we think is the appropriate sanction for a crime as serious as murder. Because if you step back and think, how did we get to this place where there are over 2 million people incarcerated? We got here because we can. Because the sentencing laws on the books permit it. So prosecutors across the country, and I'll zero in on New York, routinely ask judges to hand down sentences like 50 to life, 75 to life, life without parole. Judges routinely grant those requests, like 50 to life and 75 to life. So how did we get to be a country with 2 million people incarcerated? Because those are the laws that the elected officials have put on the books. And we can read all the new Jim Crows and we can all the, talk about all the mass incarceration. And yet there has not been a single bill proposed in this country to reduce sentences. Not even a hint of political courage. You know, as many of you are probably familiar with the, the more than 2 million people incarcerated, let me just put this in context for you. So the most recent statistic I saw is that the United States represents about 4.4% of the world's population, yet 22% of the world's incarcerated are in this country. Think about that. More than one in five people incarcerated in the world is incarcerated here in the United States. So how did we get here? There's a punitive nature, a punitive drive, a push for eternal punishment, vengeance of some sort, that I think describes the, not only American criminal legal system, but in many ways, the way this country deals with so many problems. The word I just keep thinking about is just punitive. There's a punishment paradigm that dictates so much of American society. And it is obviously most magnified in the criminal legal system. Some friends at an organization called the Sentencing Project have been, they actually got to testify in Congress and they urged Congress to take the lead, redraft the sentencing provisions of what's called the model penal code, set a 20 year maximum for any crime. I would love to know what you all think about that. A 20 year maximum. Their argument is that would place America in line with all other industrialized nations. In New York, rather than a 20 year maximum, stay with me on this, we have over 9,000 people serving sentences with 20 year minimums, minimums. So I hope you begin to get an idea of where the need for clemency comes in, where the need for some degree of, of courage from elected officials whether at the legislative or the executive branch comes in. But I wanna mention two other ways I think about courage in the work that we've been doing. One is the most remarkable and beautiful thing that I've ever seen, and I cannot overstate that. In the work that we do, we work, we, we meet families of people who lost loved ones to violence, often 30, 40 years before and we reach out to them. We let them know that we're representing the person who committed the crime that has just devastated, ripped a hole in their hearts. 
irreparable harm and trauma, incalculable, unknowable to me having been blessed to never experience that. And there have been people, and I don't know if courage is the right word. I don't know that it's forgiveness either. I, I struggle with the right word, but I will tell you this much. The one thing I am sure of is it's an extraordinary act that people, not the majority by any stretch, but several people have said, you know, thank you for telling us what this person has been up to. We're prepared to write a letter in support of their clemency application. We think after 30, 35, 40 years and the person they've become and the personal statement they wrote that you sent us, we think enough already. And there's something, I don't, again, I don't know if courageous is the word, but I can tell you it's as powerful as anything I've read. And the last part of courage that I wanna mention is the people we work with, the people inside. I don't know how people survive these massive death by incarceration sentences, I really don't. It, to me, it's courage magnified. It's, it's courage to the nth degree. People who are destined to perish in prison, who devote themselves to self-growth and awareness. I've met poets, scholars, artists, mentors. The indomitability of the human spirit is remarkable to behold. The people who do not succumb to despair and... Um, I find that truly remarkable. And again, I don't know if courageous is the word, but I wanna leave you with two specific examples. I started by talking about Judy Clark and I wanna go back to, to Judy because after all it is Women's History Month and Judy is one of the most courageous people that I have ever had the privilege of knowing. Uh, Judy was convicted for her role in a somewhat famous infamous incident in 1983 the robbery of a Brinks armored truck and the, the murder of a Brinks guard and two Nyack, New York uh, police officers. Judy's role in this, she was a getaway driver. She was unarmed. She didn't shoot anybody. She was a, a distance from the scene where this happened. But there's this antiquated law in the books called felony murder. And what that means is if you were involved with an underlying felony, like a robbery, and in the course of that robbery, someone is killed, you can be charged with murder even though you had no intent to murder anyone, nothing to do with the murder. So Judy was convicted of felony murder, uh, sentenced to 75 to life, 25 years for each of the three people who were killed. The people who planned the murder were members of an organization called the Black Liberation Army. And even though this was in 1983, it was an offshoot, a remnant of the Weather Underground, the Black Panthers, and it was a very political act. And in fact, Judy's trial was fiercely political. She and her co-defendants refused to attend the trial, refused to recognize the authority of the court to hear the case, but she did deliver a very brief closing argument to the jury. So at the end of the trial, the prosecutor makes an argument to the jury and so does the um, defense lawyer. Judy and her two defendants didn't have a defense lawyer. They didn't, again, they just said, we want nothing to do with this, but they did want this one opportunity to be heard. So if you'll bear with me, I just wanna read a little bit of this from 1983, from Judy Clark's closing argument to the jury. I did not come here with a long exposition. Have no fear, judge. Just a few remarks about what happened during this trial to give you a different perspective on that, because in truth, there are two very different perspectives on what has gone on here. And while the perspective represented by the judge and the prosecutor is one that holds power and therefore determines what happens here, we are struggling to bring to light a radically different perspective on the facts and fictions presented here. Perhaps it will not change your mind, those of you who sit in judgment in the jury box, but perhaps it will shed light on some new things as well. Perhaps you will think differently when something happens in your life, like for instance, the next time you hear about an unarmed black man being killed by police. This was 1983, okay? Or perhaps the next time you hear about the Klan or some organization marching for white supremacy, 1983. And then you have to ask yourself, who are the criminals? Soon this charade called a trial will be over. The judge will tell you to do your duty as a juror, just as they tell Marines to do their duty. Because 
your patriotic duty is apparently to uphold the American system. In this society, patriotic means to uphold and fight for racism, colonialism, and apartheid, to maintain a system that brings evisceration, violence, degradation of women and social decay, ecological disaster, and war to its own doorstep. That is why so many of its children have said and are saying, no, there is something more important than patriotism. There has to be a better way than the American way. That is why there are women like myself who are saying we will fight for the liberation of oppressed people and oppressed nations. Judy was convicted, sentenced to 75 to life. In December of 2016, the governor did grant her clemency application and she was released two years later. She now works for an organization called Our Children that serves presently and formerly incarcerated women and their children and is just living her life. Uh, contributing on the outside. Parenthetically, one of her co-defendants, a man named Gabe, David Gilbert, was also a getaway driver, unarmed, did not shoot anybody. But David is still in prison. He's 76 years old. He served nearly 40 years, making him one of the oldest and longest serving people in New York State Prison. We filed David's clemency application April 1, uh, but to date there's been no action if uh, you're at all interested in learning a little bit more about this, I, I urge you to read an article that just came out in The Nation by David's son, Cheza Boudin, who is the District Attorney of San Francisco. I think it will give you some background about a child's experience when a parent is sentenced to life or a long-term sentence. So mindful of time, let me just mention a couple other things. In the course of working with Judy, I wrote a few pieces, small pieces, op-eds. We took on more clients. The CUNY Law School students just fanned out across prisons all over New York State, and word began to spread. To date, we've gotten over 2,100 requests for help from people inside, their families, emails, text messages, every day. Every day, there are between five to seven letters or emails from saying, please, can you help my father, my son, my partner? Every January, I get between 18 and 20 new students. We take on another 10, 12 people, but it is a drop in the bucket. But we just began a new group in January and we're confronting a lot of these hard questions. And in many ways, I ask my students to find some courage. And in that, I mean, I don't handle them with kid gloves. They are working with people who are convicted. I can't overemphasize this enough. It's critical. It has to be at the forefront of any discussion of mass incarceration. People who are convicted of gruesome, horrific, heinous crimes. We're representing a 16 year old. Well, excuse me, he was 16. When an argument over stereo equipment, he shot and killed two other 16 year olds. Their families are devastated. He got 50 to life. So he'll see the parole board when he's 66. We're working with him. We represent a man who, when he was 18 and 39 days, embarked on a scheme with his then girlfriend to rob her father. She didn't get along with her father, said he's got about $30,000 in the house. I'm gonna let you in in the middle of the night Take the 30,000, you and me are gonna run away together. Well, the 18 year old, our current client brought a friend with him and things very quickly fell apart. The father wasn't there, but the mother was. A fight ensued, guns were brought out. The mother was killed. The 16 year old girlfriend was killed. Her 14 year old brother was killed. Horrific. There's no other, I don't know what other word. Our client was sentenced to life without parole when he was 18. 32 years later, he's a 50 year old man. We speak with him. The students with a little bit of trepidation at first, but in short order, the trepidation fades away. 
they begin to say, where is clemency for someone like him? He's the one who introduced the students to a phrase some of you might have heard, right? Hurt people hurt people. Let me tell you something about my own life, my own trauma. So we wrestle with the question whether or not there should be a second look. Has someone like this man, has he forfeited the right to ever be free because of the harm that he has done? So when I think about courage and what we think about and what we talk about in our class about courage, I think it's more of a collective courage that we need to confront these hard questions, to not just dispose of people. Maybe it's collective compassion instead of courage, collective mercy, collective humanity. So let me close with one other letter. This is from a man named Arnie Raimondo who gave me permission to mention his name. This is a type of letter that we get every day. And Arnie put it beautifully. It's from 2018. I'm writing this because I need assistance with my bid for clemency. I'm 67 years old and have spent 36 years in prison on two consecutive 20 to life sentences for a double homicide that occurred in Brooklyn in 1981. Prior to this case, I have had what I consider an extensive background. I make no bones about it. I was a bad guy. After returning from Vietnam in 1970 at the age of 19, I was full of anger and bitterness. I lost respect for authority and was too immature to deal with it constructively. I don't claim Vietnam is an excuse for my actions. I can only attribute those to my own flaws. But the aftermath and the psychological influence are part of the reason for the path I chose. But I have long since chosen a different path. I've been told that you and your students help people seeking clemency. I hope you will take on my case. Please believe that I am not the callow or callous young man I was. Shakespeare once wrote, the best men are made faults and for the most part are all the better for having been a little bad. Please take my case. We took Arnie's case on December 24th, of 2020, he was granted clemency, which is remarkable. Um, Arnie sent me a text message when I was reached out to him to ask if I could read his letter. And it said, Steve, I'm thrilled to be home, but I mourn for all the others I left inside. Uh, just a powerful statement. So that's, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Stephen. That was a really powerful talk. Um, and I think it really uh, sums up and, 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 and directly confronts the questions of this course on how does one live a life courageously? Uh, I really love the way you, you put it. Um, we're gonna, we, we're gonna try and experiment and allow the students to break into breakout rooms for about six to seven minutes so that they can talk about your talk and um i'm sorry uh they can talk about your talk and formulate some questions and then we'll all come back and have a q a so craig are you here can you break everyone into the breakout rooms um roger hi i'm here yeah can you break everyone out of the breakout rooms caravel is gonna do oh, Carabel. Great. Carabel, can you inst institute, instigate that? And then she'll send a two minute warning when uh, it's time to come back. Uh, is that happening yet? Yeah, takes a moment. Okay. Uh, the we're unassigned because we're co-hosts. Oh, do you oh, want okay. to be? In? So we, we can assign ourselves to rooms. Yeah. I think you um, should be able to pop in. So the how box. do we assign ourselves to room if we want to? 
Do you want me to put you in a room? I mean, Steve, do you want to be in a room or would you like a break? Uh, you tell first before we do any of that, or would you like to just talk or are you on a break or? I'm at your disposal, whatever, whatever works from your uh, perspective, whatever works best. I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think it might be good if we all went into some of the rooms. What do you think, Valentina? Are you all right with that? Or do you want yeah, us to just talk? I agree. Okay. Steven, do you mind if we assign you into a room? I mean, you could just sort of lurk in the background if you want, or, or you can participate. Sure. I think okay. the students will be thrilled. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. So Karimba, can you uh, assign us to a room then? Uh, all right. Thanks.
we I think we're back. Are we back? Yeah. Um, Steven, are you here? Just so I know. I'm here, yes. I'm in okay, North great. North. Great, well, um, again, thank you for uh, a, a, a really fantastic talk. And I think um, certainly the breakout room I was in, the, uh, the, 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 the tone was, this was amazing and really provocative to people. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, people to, um, uh, you, can, you can ask questions. The, the easiest way is actually to raise your hand um, and, uh, and I, will, I will recognize you. I'm, I'm unfortunately on my phone, so trying to, to see it, but um, if there are people with hands raised, and I don't see them, let me know. But uh, just raise your hand. Sage, you wanna start us off and ask a question? Uh, yeah, so I am wondering, I know you had talked about a solution to the mass incarceration, mass incarceration problem being that of a legislative process and looking at clemency. But I'm also wondering is, if we're looking at this in a long-term situation that we want to, fully fix the problem, or at least work towards fully fixing it, what would be a way that we could implement, like what were, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what, do you have any other ideas of ways we could implement like other societal values and like society, like not just the legislative process, but as well as like things that we can do as a society and community as a whole to help combat this issue? Well, thank you for that question. Yeah, I do. I do. I, I had the, um, the good fortune several years ago of listening to Ruth Wilson Gilmore talking about prison abolition. And what seems like in many ways sort of a basic approach, but it's redirecting, reallocating funds. You know, one of the things we never ask in the prosecution and adjudication of the cases of all these people serving these massive sentences, no one ever asked what were all the factors that led to this incident? What, and is there a way to prevent this from happening again? And I never sat down with the data, but I, would, I, I am so sure this is true that the overwhelming majority in New York State, for example, of the 9,000 lifers come from probably a discrete set of zip codes across the state. And those zip codes are going to be marked by um, poor health care, education, housing, and employment. So to me, we, you know, the cost of incarceration is so great, literally in dollars and cents. And if that money, if that money was redirected into the communities that are most impacted, I think it would have a dramatic effect. I mean, I, 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 it's not only the certain zip codes. Each individual you work with, I mean, I'm stating something obvious, is a, is a different person with their own history, story, narrative, but there are certain commonalities. I got to eighth grade. We, we struggled, my mother struggled to put food on the table. Um, lack of employment opportunities. And I know that for some people, I've been told when you go down this path, people think it's this sort of bleeding heart lefty kind of silliness. To me, it's as real as anything could possibly be real. So Sage, to that question, yeah, the legislative fix is, is really just a way to get people out. It doesn't address the larger picture. It's what are we gonna do if we start getting people out, the prisons shrink and we have millions of dollars to use elsewhere. If it's put it, if it's invested in the way it should be and traditionally has not been, do I think that could make a difference? Yes, I do. Great. Um, Charlotte has a question. Hello. Um, thank Hi. you for your lecture. Um, in our uh, breakout room, we were talking about the like political arguments that could be made to convince a clemency board to grant clemency. Um, and just kind of like what arguments can 
be made in general um, because uh, I actually took the clemency class two semesters ago and our group found it really difficult to come up with a comprehensive argument outside of compassion um, to convince Andrew Cuomo and the clemency group. Well, if I could answer that question, Charlotte, it's, I will say this much, the related work that we do has to do in the parole world. Because one of the other drivers of mass incarceration are parole boards that are so risk averse that they deny parole over and over and over to people who present no threat to public safety on any measure, including evidence-based risk assessment tools and so forth. What's beginning to change there is a groundswell of community advocates, activists on the ground, people from impacted communities making their voices heard. Um, there are two bills pending in the New York State Legislature right now that are driven by family members of people who've been incarcerated, the elder parole bill, fair and timely parole bill. So Charlotte, I think if that voice was heard, if it was marshaled and made loud enough, it might just convince elected officials that it's in their political best interest. Because I hear you, the argument for compassion and decency and mercy um, and I know this sounds overly, I don't even know what, sad, cynical, uh, is not getting us very far. So I, I, I look at, for one example, I'll, I'll give you, I'll leave you with this, stop and frisk. For those of you who are familiar with the whole stop and frisk conflagration in New York, where the numbers went from 45,000 a year to 100 to 600 to 700,000 people stopped and frisked. You know, 92% people of color, 90% didn't have anything on them. It looked like it was never going to stop. And something happened along the way, where suddenly in our last election for the mayor of New York City, all the candidates were trying to step over each other saying, who was going to be the first to limit, if not eviscerate, stop and frisk? Something happened. Something persuaded people seeking elected office that it was the right thing to do. From my vantage point, I think a lot of it was that there was enough noise made by people from the communities who felt the brunt of stop and frisk. So I think a lot of it is political activism. Young people making noise. Thanks, Stephen. Um, there's a, a couple more questions uh, in the queue. Um, Antonio Polaris. Yeah, hi. Um, I really appreciated how you emphasized uh, the concept of clemency and in our breakout room we were talking about uh, we were trying to think how the justice system is um, pretty is is based very much around the concept of punishment and it's a punitive institution and we I was wondering how what do you think are ways for us? I think this goes around, is kind of in the lines of Sage's question. How, do, how can we reimagine the justice system and what effects do you think it, it could have? There's a movement certainly in legal circles right now where people keep referring to reformist reforms, meaning reforms that tinker around the edges and that don't really change things. And can we think bolder and broader? And I find that compelling, but being self-referential, it's so hard for me to do. I feel so encumbered, you know, by what I know. So I end up gravitating towards what would be characterized as a reformist reform, meaning it, you made things a little better, but you really didn't change things. So there are people saying, can we get back to a rehabilitative paradigm in prisons? Would that make a difference? Um, I don't think so, only because I see so many rehabilitated people and it doesn't seem to matter to anybody. I think it's more a matter of can we, can the next generation of activists social justice activists, lawyers, non-lawyers, community organizers, can we say, you know what, 
we need to rethink this whole process. And I, and I come to that, I, I wanna give you one very concrete example. There's an annual summit in Otisville Correctional Facility run by the Lifers and Long-Termers organization at Otisville. And the summit is centered around parole reform. And I, uh, two years ago, I invited a district attorney who, is, who holds himself out as one of the most progressive in New York State and, and probably is, frankly. And we were at a table with a bunch of men from his county having lunch. And he, to his credit, he said, tell me, what are you, what are you serving here? 50 to life. How about you? 75 to life. And he was empathetic. He listened and he said, this is, something's got to change. And I was so hopeful in that moment. And it was about a month later that I got a press release from that same district attorney's office announcing with pride the conviction of two men who were sentenced to 50 to life. It's just so ingrained and embedded that how do we get to a different place where these numbers are not sort of a fait accompli? Antonio, I'm not sure of the answer other than there, and this sounds, you know, I keep going back to Judy Clark and her version, her vision of radical change, of tearing things down and building them back up. Um, the criminal legal system, I'm not the first to say this. It's not dysfunctional. It's not broken. It's doing what it's intended to do. Mm. You know, mass incarceration is not an accident. I don't believe it's an accident. I think it preserves power and wealth where it's supposed to preserve power and wealth. So I wish I had a better answer for you other than saying at some point we have to rethink what we do with someone who's convicted of a crime. And it's been far too easy in particular because, again, a stat you all know, it's not a stat, it's a human reality. The majority of these 9,000 people serving life sentences are people of color. That doesn't seem to bother the people who set the sentencing laws or the judges or the prosecutors who put them there. Somehow we have to take their power away so that they can't do that. Easier said than done, I know. Thank you. Um, Valentina. Hey, Steven. So in our breakout room, I had asked you your thoughts on reforming prosecutors. And I basically just wanted you to restate that answer for the whole group. Um, OK, sure. Um, you know, there, there is a, a movement of sorts going on across the country, a very well-intentioned movement for progressive prosecutors well-funded campaigns in some of the biggest cities in the country where people with much more progressive platforms than the current district attorney are running and have had some success. The question is, is that really making the sort of difference that Antonio and Sage and others are, are looking for? And so far, I don't even, I don't even think you have to say the jury is still out, I think it's pretty clear it's not making that much of a difference. Um, what I told Valentina is I actually know somebody who works in one of the more progressive district attorney offices in the country in Philadelphia. The district attorney there is a person named Larry Krasner who's generally held up as one of the most progressive prosecutors in, in the United States. He comes from a background as a civil rights litigator. And what I asked her is, what is the caseload of a line district attorney in Philadelphia? How many people are they prosecuting at any one time? And she said about 120. And I said, well, how many of the 120 are people of color? And she said about 115. And to me, that just tells you the fundamental problem with a system we've set up where it's somebody's job to prosecute 115 people of color. You can do it more kindly and more gently, but that doesn't lead to wholesale change. Valentina, do you want to add anything or, or not?
No, I think that was it. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and focus on some of the student questions because this is related to a class. So I think Miles, Miles Hansen. I would ask, um, how do you define the idea of redemption? Is it a act of action that the prisoner must uh, take in or is it like when we're talking about the policy of limiting long-term sentences, is that just a basic human right that everyone deserves a chance of redemption? So to get commuted, do you have to be a choir boy or can you make some mistakes while in prison? Boy, do I love that question. I, you know, I've been told by so many people, they hate that word. Like I'm not, what does it mean for me to be redeemed, free from sin? You know, I, I don't, it's, you know where that gets me to in many ways? I think I was mentioning this to a few others before. Um, the problem with redemption as a, a standard is it leads us to this place where the only people who deserve clemency or deserve a second look at their sentencing are the exceptional, which is so problematic. I, I feel in some ways, frankly, in the clemency world in New York, partly responsible. I, I had early on, I, I received a bunch of letters from people saying to me, you have to help out this guy, this one particular guy, a man named Roy Bolas. Roy's extraordinary. Said, you know, he's gotten two masters and he's like four credits away or something. He's like hours away from a PhD in prison. The first person in New York State history to earn a PhD while incarcerated. And I met Roy and Roy's extraordinary. He'd written like a 400 page. It, it, Roy's just extraordinary. His clemency case was pretty easy to make. Redemption? I mean, he wrote about remorse. He wrote about Hobbes and Locke. I mean, Roy's, Roy's mind is, is extraordinary. And the governor's people, when they got a copy of his dissertation, said, can we meet him? Um, so he got clemency, but I've been told multiple times that the bar is now ridiculously high because everybody, they, you know, all the blurbs, they wrote, oh, this guy, he's brilliant. Of course, he's going to get clemency. Well, what about the people who lack that capacity? So, I, you know, I hesitate to, word, to use the word redemption as presently defined, Miles. I agree with you. I think on some level, what we're looking for is some insight into the conduct that led them, some, some growth. And even when I say that, I hesitate because there are people in prison serving massive sentences who just don't have the capacity, the wherewithal to make the case for themselves. They might be incredibly quiet, shy. Um, you can go on and on. They just don't have the ability to put themselves out there. They haven't done all the programs. They haven't excelled. They haven't brought themselves to the attention of the volunteers in the prison. So does that mean we cast them aside because they are, quote, unexceptional? So the redemption piece is, is, is a real challenge. I'll give you one related word that comes up all the time is remorse. The governor's people have told us that a personal statement should reflect genuine, authentic remorse. And I defy anyone to explain to me how anybody is going to judge the authenticity of somebody else's stated remorse. It's an emotion. How, how does anybody have the hubris? I, I, it, it's mind boggling to me. So people struggling with try to, trying to write personal statements saying I'm redeemed or I am so remorseful. And they're told, well, you can't just say you're remorseful. You have to persuade people you're remorseful. Well, how do I do that in, in text? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. So I, I think it's, it's a wonderful question. It gets me to the place of, do you even need to show some degree of extraordinary achievement, remorse, redemption, or can we just say, we think the appropriate punishment is going to be capped here as opposed to where we have it? So I'm very grateful for that question. Stephen, can I follow up on that question? Because I think it is a great question and, and I, I'm really, interested in your approach to it and, and your answers to it. Um, you know, when I was, when I was taught clemency and pardon, you know, you know, as you started out your talk, these are extraordinary, um, 
weapons or, or aspects of the legal system, they're, they're actually extra legal in many ways. Um, and that's why they're put with the executive. And, and, and the reason was because how is a judge or a jury supposed to determine remorse or determine, you know, uh, redemption? I mean, it's, it's almost impossible, as you, as you rightly said. And so it was almost something so exceptional that it was like, you know, almost from God. It was from this, the governor or the president or the dictator, or whoever it was. Um, and so there, there's, there is this sort of idea that, you know, you can, that more and more, at least around pardons, what governors and presidents are requiring is that you sort of relitigate the case and you show you are innocent. Um, and with clemency, you're, you're supposed to show you are so redemptive and so remorseful that, you know, you, you deserve it. And, and, and this is an impossible standard. And, and that's what you're seeing, except for these exceptional few. So I'm wondering what, what, I mean, I, I understand the moral empathetic grounds for the clemency project, but you know, you mentioned this other idea, capping all sentences at 20 years or something like that. Why isn't this the, the legislative project? Why, why, is, why is the audience 50 governors and one president and not, you know, legislators and people? I'm just wondering how you imagine that. And have you thought about, change, you know, why, why do you focus on clemency and the governors? That's, I guess, the question. Sure. Thanks, Roger. The, the short answer, partly stumbling into clemency work, but there's the immediacy of it. I don't need, a legisl I don't need the legislature to convene and, and wait years. So, and I know that's kind of a glib answer, but we do, we do push for the legislative piece. So I'll mm -hmm. give you some concrete examples. There's a bill proposed by Senator Cory Booker and Representative Karen Bass called the uh, Second Look Bill, which is something I have been trying to get on the New York State radar screen for three years now. We have a version, but it's weak. The Second Look Bill and Cory Booker's star, you know, right now is, is pretty high up there. The Second Look Bill says that regardless of your crime of conviction, regardless of your original sentence, you are entitled to a second look at your sentence after 10 years in prison. And my line, which I've kind of, I stole somewhat, but I'll claim it as my own, is that a sentence once imposed does not remain just, necessary, and appropriate in perpetuity. So we should take a second look at every single human being and say to ourselves, okay, it's 10 years later, is this still the right thing to do? And so, yes, a legislative fix would, would relegate clemency to the most exceptional, unusual situation and would do a lot more to alleviate the problems than these individual clemency applications. No question. No question. I'll mention kind of a footnote to that for those of you who are interesting, interested. Some of the bills that are out there across the country are looking at who is who who are the people who are the embodiments of mass incarceration. So they've targeted two specific groups. One is older people in prison, who every study, all the data shows present no threat to public safety whatsoever, people in their 60s and 70s. So they're attempting to pass bills saying even someone doing life without parole, if you're in your 60s or 70s, at least if you are over 55 and you served at least 15 years, you should have the opportunity to make your case before a board, like a parole board. The other part of that, which is where I've spent more time, is actually the United States Supreme Court in the last several years has taken a very hard look at life sentences for people who are convicted for crimes committed when they were very young. So it started with the Supreme Court saying if you were 17 or under, the death penalty was unconstitutional as applied to you. Then it became life without parole, mandatory life without parole for someone 17 or younger was unconstitutional. The theory, and this was remarkable that it went to the Supreme Court, was based on neuroscience and brain development. Some expert testifying not just in this social psychological kind of way, but actually with brain imagery, 
to show that all of our brains aren't fully formed till our mid 20s. So the part they talk about the frontal lobe, I believe, parts of your brain that control impulsivity, for example. And the Supreme Court agreed and they said, okay, at least if you were 17 and under. So there's many states are passing laws requiring second look sentencing for anybody who was convicted when they were under a certain age. Right now, DC has the most ambitious bill. If you were convicted of any crime when you were 25 or under, regardless of what the crime is, regardless what sentence you received, you should have the opportunity after 10 years to argue for resentencing. So a very long-winded answer, Roger, to say, yes, I think the legislative fix is the way to go. Right now, I can tell you this, New York State hasn't had much appetite for it. I appreciate that. I mean, and uh, yeah, I mean, it just strikes me that, I mean, are the, are the videos you and your students make allowed to be shown outside of clemency hearings? I mean, could you put them on TV advertisements or on YouTube or, or are they? I mean, it strikes me that it could be an incredibly powerful argument, not just for clemency, but for, but for the legislative argument. And I'm not sure if, if that's been already done and I'm just not aware of it. It, it hasn't been done on a grand scale and Tom can actually talk to that more so than I can. We, we tried to figure out what to do with these. We include them in the clemency application. We know they, it moves people. The question is, are we moving people to move the governor to make him sign the application? But the larger point about how do we change hearts and minds and can we use these videos, which I defy anybody to look at the videos that the Bard students have put together and not come away feeling like, why is this person relegated to die in prison or to, to spend another day? So I, I think you're exactly right. We just haven't yet got our arms around the best campaign and right, about how to really use these to maximize impact. Those of you who haven't seen it, you should really take a look at the video that Valentina was crucially involved in for Rodney Chandler. Maybe Valentina, you can put a link in the in the chat. Um, I, there's a question by from Reiner Turin. Hi. Um, well, I uh, kind of question based off the last few questions were: um, Is my uh, frustration with the idea that um, families that are affected? Um, have a judgment of, of the case or they have a view of it that's not on the prosecutors or not the judges. And it seems to exist outside or as an effect. Um, and I'm wondering, um, similar to the idea of, you know, reforming prosecutors, how do you reform prosecutors in a way that it doesn't become a kind of binary of the prosecution uh, and the kind of, you know, defendant or um, the family that's being, that will suffer the brute of the, of the judgment from the judge. Yeah, another terrific question. And there's a movement afoot. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the phrase restorative justice. And there's a wonderful book that if you're interested in this by a woman named Daniel Sered called Until We Reckon that I urge you to read. And, and what, she, what she's talking about reckoning with is with violent crime and what is the role of the victims or the victim's family? And why is it that right now there is virtually nothing offered to the family members other than, do you think this person should come home? Do we offer any sort of help, support. And to me, this is this comes up the most in our parole work. So somebody gets 25 to life and they'll see the board after 25 years. And there's a victim impact statement. And what I have heard from victims, family members, I'm talking about in a homicide case, is I haven't heard from anybody about this case for 25 years. And then I get a letter from the parole board saying, this person's up for parole. Yeah, we want to hear from you. And the impulse at that point in time, you've just now revived trauma, which has probably never subsided that much. Asking someone to put something in writing, as opposed to saying, where have we been? Where has anybody been to offer me and my family support for the last 25 years? So that maybe there's a better way to heal, to repair, than just asking me, do I support this person who ripped my soul apart going home? 
we've kind of set it up that you're going to get a, a certain kind of response from family. So, yeah, the, the victims, the victims' family, um, that piece is untended to. And I think we would have a very different system if we paid more attention to the people who are harmed. And I say that people who are harmed by the people that I represent. Thank you. Um, this will be the last question, I think, from Emily Rosacrantz. Hi. Um, so I just actually kind of had a follow up to what Rainer was asking and just kind of thinking about how like you've spoken a lot about as well, like the family of the incarcerated person and the effect that it has on them. Do you think that a situation where like not only they like have a victim impact letter, but maybe like a, a letter from the family of the incarcerated person letter and just kind of see the impact of not only the crime, but also the time in prison and how that's affected like all of the families? Yes. It's a wonderful idea. So for example, in parole proceedings, the parole board can meet with the victim's family face-to-face -face, and their input is a, a separate category. I can get a letter from the mother, for example, of my client who's coming up for parole, but it's, it's almost discounted in my experience. And the same with clemency. And to me, that says we're not taking this holistic view about repairing, about what when you deny parole over and over and over, what's the impact on the family, on the children? You know, I think this might be up somewhere. If you want, there's a wonderful uh, TED talk. It's actually called TEDx because it's from Sing Sing. It's from Men Inside. One of our one of our clients, a guy named Bruce Bryan, did a remarkable presentation about the impact on the children of the incarcerated. Um, trying to, you know, Emily, I wish we had more success in getting parole boards and the governor's clemency people to appreciate the impact beyond the victim's family. Because you're, you're exactly right. It's devastating. I forget the number. Someone can pull it up somewhere on Google. The, the number of children who have an incarcerated parent. And shouldn't that somehow affect how we think about these massive sentences, the impact on family and community, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, well, Stephen, thank you so much. This was an uh, extraordinary talk and I think it gave us a, all a lot to, to think about and worry about. And, I, I hope, uh, I'm glad you're going to be continuing. I, I assume you will, you and Tom will continue to work together and be part of the Bard community. So that's really wonderful. Um, thanks, a lot. Thanks, thanks to you. And thanks to Valentina and the rest of the Courage to Be team. And uh, thank you all for, for being here. I, I think the uh, breakout sessions were good. Let us, oops, whoops, let us know what you think. And uh, we'll see you all at the next talk. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody.